Jamie was praying for us and even challenging us to, uh, to worship and to worship with more than just song and to worship with our life, um, I was probably about four years ago, uh, a little over that, I encountered one of the most profound worship experiences that, that I've been a part of and really that I got to witness. Um, actually, just really life-changing for me and my family. It started with a uh, started with a phone call, one of those phone calls that no one ever wants to receive. Um, it was one evening I I got this call and a uh, pastor at the church I was serving at told me that uh, a buddy of mine had been um, he'd been killed, and I was um, at that point I was just thinking, there's no way he's my age, three small children. Uh, make matters worse, it wasn't just a loss of life. He was he was actually shot and um, shot by his own brother. Um, brother ended up taking his own life. My wife, at the moment, at the time, I'm like, Terry, you got to go get to Wendy. Went, Chris was his name. Wendy was, was hers. And um, so Terry went to, to where she was at and, you know, just cried with her and prayed with her and walked her through it. The night was terrible. I remember going and getting the three children, um, having to take them to the church. And that's where they'd find out they'd never see their dad again. And um, it's terrible. 36 hours, 72 hours. You're just trying to process it, get ready for a funeral, trying to help this family mourn this senseless, unexpected loss. Um, Chris was big into missions. And, um, and one, one time when he was headed overseas, he had a little sketch pad. And as he was writing some notes, preparing for this trip, he had, he had actually thought, man, if, if I go on a trip and don't come back, what, what am I going to do? And so he, he wrote a few things down, and some of the things he wrote down were, uh, these are the passages I want preached at my funeral, and these are the songs that I want sung. And, um, and so the, that little sketch pad, um, we, just, we just used it as the playbook. And that day that the funeral was to take place, the place was packed, and um, our worship team got on the stage just like this. And they played through that song list. And I'm sitting on the front row and I'm thinking, I've got to get up here and prepare to deliver a funeral message. But the message was being preached already. Because Wendy was right there on the front row, hands up, worshiping. I'm like, there's nothing I need to say right now. What, what am I going to say to add to this? Right? What am I going to say? This, that is the message. The message is that she says, I don't understand this. This is senseless. This loss is tragic. But as she raises her hands to worship, she's declaring, I trust you. She's declaring, I love you. And even though this broken world has brought major heartache, I, I just, I'm just going to trust you. Even though this doesn't make sense, I'm going to trust you. Even this, though this isn't how Chris and I dreamed it would be as a family and, and, and the way we were hoping it would go, we're just going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And I, I mean, I'm like, man, what, what do I have to offer after that, right? What do I have to offer after that? Um, as I think about just that, that ability to, to say, I trust you, I, the words of Hebrews 11, just remember, remember how this thing started. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. As Wendy, with her hands raised, she was saying, I am assured of what's hoped for. And what's hoped for, what the promises are, is this. Here's the promise. The promise is that Chris is no longer in his body. And he is absent from the body, but he is present with Christ. And so she was assured in that moment as she raised her hands, just trusting in that. That's pretty good, isn't it? She was assured in the moment. That as she raised her hands to worship, that she said, this is not the end. That I will have an opportunity to see Chris again because this is not the end. Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I've put my faith in that and there is eternal life. And Chris had put his faith and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this isn't it. There will be a glorious reunion and I worship and trust even though... I can't see it now. I am assured of your word. I am trusting your word. 
trusting it, right? Man, what a powerful testimony. Uh, Spurgeon said this, great preacher, he said, um, death is a thorough test of faith. Death is a thorough test of faith. Um, today we're going we're gonna to continue to look at Abraham and Abraham is going gonna, gonna to be faced with death and it is going to be a thorough test of his faith. A thorough test in how assured is he of God's word, of his promises. How assured, how convinced, how convicted, how solid is he in the promises and in the word of God. How assured is he of that? Because it's a significant test. If you got your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 11 we did a little bit of Abraham's story last week, but we've got to continue this one just so big, it's such a big part of his story that we're just going to kind of hold it here on its own and, and just recognize the, the thorough test that it is. Um, we're, we're working our way through Hebrews chapter 11. We've done Abel and Enoch and Noah, and, and we've spent a little time on Abraham, and all of these people should inspire us. All of them should show us that we too can persevere, that we too can endure, that we too can have a faith that is a thriving fellowship with God that is growing us to be more and more like Christ. Let me read it to you, verse 17. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. And it was he whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. Now, I'm going to unpack some of that here in a moment. But the, the main thing I want to focus on just for a second is that that word, he was tested. Remember I said that, that death is a thorough test of our faith and, and here we have this idea of Abraham being tested. The, the author of Hebrews is just borrowing from the language of Genesis 22. He is reminding these Jewish Christians in first century Rome about a story that they would know really, really, really well. And he's reminding them that Abraham was, was tested. When we think about a test, um, we, we ought to think about several things. We ought to think about the idea that it, that it proves, that it reveals who we already are. Let me say that again, because this one, this one hurts for me. It reveals who I already am. That's what it does. It, it just pulls the curtain back and it just shows me who I am. And so as Wendy is sitting there worshiping this test of faith is just revealing that she walks with Jesus, that she loves God, that she trusts his word, right? She, it's just showing you who it is. The word there in the original language, pirazzo, is, is translated a couple of different ways in your New Testament. It's translated temptation sometimes, and then sometimes it's translated test. Obviously, the context allows us to know which of those is happening. A temptation would be where the enemy is using some trial in our life to ensnare us, to entice us to evil, to have doubt, to, to question, to, to sit back and say, hey, I want to bring you into evil. Whereas a test would be from God and it's more the opportunity to reveal who we are, to create humility, character, integrity, Christ-likeness. One has a negative end and an and the test has a positive end. As Dave Anderson would say, there's two sides to every trial. One where the enemy is trying to test you to do evil, and then the other side where you have an opportunity to glorify God and to grow in Christ's likeness. Um, I'm not, not sure how well we do at those tests and trials all the time. If I'm being completely forthright, a lot of times, um, I just don't like trials. I try to run away from trials. I try my best to avoid them or blame them on someone else. And so as a result, sometimes it just reveals just how, how wicked and gross I really am. 
Uh, I'll give you an example of that. I, I, last Saturday, I had to drive to Mobile, Alabama to pick up my twin boys. We left them in South Carolina. They were finishing up a baseball season. The all-star tournament was coming to a close, but I needed to get here and, and hang out with family and help get transitioned. And I drove to Mobile, Alabama on I-10. And if I-10 would ever be a test and a trial, it is. It is, right? And I get on that highway and, and it was early in the morning and it was great until other people began to join me on the road. And I get there and, and I get my twins. It was already brutal. It shouldn't have taken as long as it was taking and coming home, it was even worse. And, 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 and there were just some times where I just, I just embarrassed myself in the car. Anybody else embarrass yourself in the car? Man, I, I know some of y'all like for everybody to merge and just cut in front of me and drive slow in the left lane and all of that, right? I know you guys are great with that. I'm not so great with that. I'm not really good with that, right? I just remember at one point, um, it just had to get quiet because just, it, was, it was just silly. And it just revealed that I was impatient. I was angry. I was done. I didn't want to be making this drive. And my, my kids are right here, and I'm, I'm frustrated about somebody being in the wrong lane. And instead of using it as an opportunity <laughs> to glorify God and to build patience and character, what did it do? It drew me to say some things I wish I hadn't have said and slammed the steering wheel and all those things, right? That's what it does. There's two sides to the coin, two sides to every, every trial. One is an enemy trying to, to ensnare and entangle, entice us to evil, and another is an opportunity to, to bring glory and honor and grow in our character, right? So here we have a, a test, and it's not just traffic, right? If I can barely pass a traffic test, man, what in the world am I going to do with this one? Verse 17, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. He offered him up. This is sacrifice. Those of you that know the story, you know it well. I'm going to go to Genesis 22 here in a moment to look at it. There's this offering up a sacrifice of his son. But look at what the author of Hebrews does. He makes sure you understand just how big this test is, just how big this personal cost will be. He says, and he, Abraham, who had received the promises, was offering up his only begotten son. Only begotten. Like this is the son that Sarah and Abraham had to wait nearly a century to have because they were unable to have children before. And when they finally have a son, this son Isaac, that, that they've been waiting on, God is now asking for a sacrifice. It's a miracle child. It's the one they've been wanting. It is their prized possession. He says, I want you to offer him up. And then he says this. Verse 18, and it was he, Abraham, to whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendant shall be called. In other words, remember that promise in Genesis 15 that you're going to look up at the stars and have that many descendants? They're going to come through Isaac. And remember Genesis 17, when you look at all the sand on the shore, that's how many descendants you're going to have. They're going to come through Isaac. And so this miracle child that you've waited for, your prized possession, and oh, by the way, all the promises promises that I made to you are going to be fulfilled through him. I need you to offer him up. What a test, isn't it? And there's all kinds of moral and ethical questions that, that we could try to parse out here. Listen, if we do that, we're distracting ourselves from the thrust of the text. And the thrust is this, what do you love more than God? Right? What do you love more than him? What would you not be willing to sacrifice? That's the point. So you have this tremendous test here. Tremendous call. I told you, death is a thorough test of faith. It's a thorough test. Let's take a look at it in Genesis 22. I don't have time to preach all the nuances of the text. I just want to remind ourselves of it. Remember, these are Jewish Christians in first century Rome that when you say Abraham, they know this story. When you say Abraham and Isaac and sacrifice, they know Genesis 22 like the back of their hand. And just for us, just, we're just gonna go back through it. it it's weighty, it's heavy, it's, it's crazy, but it's, 
It's a great challenge to us. Verse 1, Genesis 22. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. There it is again. He's borrowing that language from the Old Testament. And said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Verse 2. He, God said, take your son, your only son whom you love. Right? The author of Hebrews was trying to grab all that language. He was trying to say, begotten son, the one you love, the one you waited on. God's saying, I want you to take your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. I don't know about you, but if I'm Abraham right now, I'm probably, I'm probably like, do we have to do that whole go to the land, I'll show you thing, right? Are we not past that? Can you just tell me where I'm going? But no, I'm going I'm to I'm gonna lead you out there. It says, I want you to take your son and offer him up. Verse 3 says, so Abraham looked at God and, and said, man, thank you for this amazing honor to be able to honor and worship you in this way. But I'm going to go back and talk to Sarah because Sarah is involved in this too. And we're going to pray and we're going to fast and we're going to seek some wise counsel. And, and we're going to see how this is all going to line up. And I'll get back to you in a couple of days. Isn't that what you wish it would say here? Maybe you would wish it would say, um, and so Abraham busted out laughing and said, that's a great joke, Lord. What's the, what, what, are, what do you really want me to do? Now look at verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning. Like he didn't sleep in. He's not taking his leisurely time with a cup of coffee. He, raised, he goes early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Three days he's walking with the donkey and these two men and his son. Three days toting lumber to this place where a hill would be. Three days he's had to process. This is what I'm fixing to have to do. Three days he does this. Three days, I'm wondering if he's like, hey, time out. Hey, will you head back to camp and get a lamb? Is he thinking in three days, do I just turn around? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And what are you thinking about it? Three days of this journey. Verse five, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. I don't know if I'm using the word worship there. Are you? Worship? Worship? How about I'm going to go and perform this act. I'm going to go and be obedient. I'm going to go and do sacrifice. Not I'm going to worship. I'm going to attribute to you the glory and the honor that you are worthy of. I'm going to worship. And then we get a glimpse into Abraham's heart. And he said, and we will return to you. Somehow in all of this, Abraham's like, no, this is going to be worship because you're a really big God and you're worthy of it. And not only that, but somehow, some way, the two of us are coming back to this deal. If it's me at this point, I'm like ending the test. Good, you've done enough. You chopped the wood. You went on a three days journey. You're ready to go up there and leave the men and the donkey behind. Okay, okay, okay. I get it. But that's not what happens. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he, he took in his hands the fire and the knife. And so the two of them walked on together. Got the fire and the knife. I got a teenage son here who's going to carry the lumber up the hill. Man, I don't know if this is silent. I don't know if this is, like, can you even make eye contact with your son at this point? Verse 7, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father! And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. Like, I get it. I get all this. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Like he's just dawning on Isaac at this moment. Like, we're supposed to be up here worshiping and giving a sacrifice and this burnt offering, and we're missing the key ingredient. 
I mean, again, I, I'm just, I don't even know if I can make eye contact at this point. Can you? Can you? Abraham said, this is great. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. He had to be choking back something there, right? Right? He's going to provide. Verse 9. They came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged on the wood, and, and arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. I mean, the author here, um, I mean, it's just getting more and more and more dramatic and climactic. I know most of the time we don't read the Bible like as literature, but this is beautiful storytelling. They are wanting you to feel angst. They are wanting you to feel weight. They are wanting you to see this is going to the end. Walk, three day journey, knife, fire, a kid with wood. We've laid him down, we've positioned the wood. I've bound him on the altar. You, you've got to be wondering what is fixing to happen. And if you've been reading Genesis 1 to Genesis 22, every ounce of your body should be crying out, no, that's the promise. That's the hope. No. Verse 10, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Like this is all just a great little trip up the mountain until you raise the knife. Right? Like this, you can, you can go on this trip, you can take the lumber, you can take your boy, you can even say, hey, we're gonna come on back down. You can call it worship, you can say a hundred different things, but listen, this thing gets real when you raise the knife. This thing gets real. Like it, it's no longer just theoretical at that point. We, we've raised the knife. In the same way, in the same way that Wendy raised her hands to say, I trust you, this doesn't make sense. This is, this is not how I drew it up. Abraham raises his knife in his hand and says, this doesn't make sense to me. This is not how I drew it up, but I trust you. I trust you. Whew. Some of the best words right here, verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Your prized possession, your trophy. You love me and trust me more than you love that boy. If you had to raise the knife against something, what would you, what would cause you to say, I can't do it? Can't do it. Remember, I told you that word test, it means to prove and show who we already are. Sometimes that is to reveal to us who we are. And sometimes it reveals that faith in who we are so that other people can be inspired by it. Four years ago, I was inspired when Wendy was doing this. And for thousands of years, people have been inspired by a man who raised the knife. Right? Thousands of years. Revealed who he was. He's just a man who trusted God. So I have no idea what he would trust. I have no idea how he could do that. Let's, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Now let me read 
verse 19. After it says, this is what he did, he offered him up, his one and only son, who all the promises would come through. Verse 19 tells us why. He, Abraham, considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. In his mind, he considered, he reckoned. It was just this, this logical next step of this is what God can do. He holds life and death in his hands. And the only way that I know that God can keep his promises and his promises were for me to have this boy and for us to have a lot of descendants from him, the only way he must be able to keep his promises is that when that blood is spilled and his heart stops, God is going to miraculously just make him come back to life and so he was willing to raise the knife wow you say what would give him that kind of trust if you haven't read Genesis 12 to 22 in a while go back and read it you need some reading this week it's great Abraham think about all that he's seen he's lied about his wife twice nearly got himself killed in the process, and God miraculously saved him. Miraculously kept Sarah pure. If you'll remember, he has seen Sodom and Gomorrah. He also saw Lot get ravaged by those four kings who came in and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah before the big fire and brimstone event and took Lot and his kids and all of his possessions out. And you remember Abraham took 300 men, went and chased four kings and their armies and got Lot in his possessions and brought them back. Listen, he has seen a lot. And not only that, he's seen a woman who wasn't able to have children miraculously conceive and give birth. When he raises the knife, he knows, I am trusting in the God who holds life and death in his hands. Do you trust him like that? Holds a life and death in his hands? And death is a thorough, thorough test of faith. Man, I... I... I I think about the, the things in my life that I need to raise a knife to. Hobbies. I don't want to quit. Things that I love. I'm, it's not even close to a son. Do you trust him? Let me show you the few more guys in this passage and we'll be done. Verse 20, 21, and 22 are Abraham's son, grandson, and great-grandson. I'm going I'm to read them. It says in verse 20, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. Verse 21, By faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each one of, his sons, of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on top of his staff. Verse 22, By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. All three of these men are being commended here for their faith at the end of their lives. The end of their lives. Can, can I just tell you the truth here? If you're Isaac and you're, you're fixing to die and you got two boys that you need to bless, if you didn't believe God's word, you'd probably look at him and say, it's all a bunch of baloney. It's all a load of crock, dude. Just go do your thing, fellas. If you're Jacob and you think this is all nuts, you're looking at Joseph and you're saying, you want me to bless your sons? Fine, but listen, this thing's all a joke. I gave my whole life to it and got nothing to show for except a bum hip. It's all a load of crock, dude. Go do your own thing. Or if you're Joseph, of all the things Joseph could be commended for, 
left for dead by his brothers, forgotten in prison, lied about. I mean, you talk about a guy with faith. And this is what he tells his brothers at the end of his life while he's dying. You ready? He doesn't say, fellas, forget the promised land. It ain't going to happen. It didn't happen for Abraham and it happened for Isaac and it didn't happen for our daddy. Stay right here in Egypt where it's nice and comfy. You know what Joseph said? One day we're going to get that land promised to our great granddad. And I need you to take my bones and I need you to take them back to the promised land. Because this thing's real. This thing's real. Death is a thorough test of faith. And here, all four of these men in facing death, facing death could say, it's the real deal. I sat at a uh, breakfast this week with a fella who's facing death. And um, just couldn't be more inspired as he looks at his children, looks at his church family and says, ah, oh, the promises are good and they're real. Persevere. Keep trusting. Keep trusting. If there was ever a chance to say, hey, dude, it's just all a load of crock. What's happening to me is not fair. Go do your own thing. He could do it. But instead he says, Trust. Trust. Um, when you came in, you got a, you got a wooden knife. and um, I was going to give you a plastic one, but Jamie, he's, he's, he's cool and creative and way more hip than I am. And so he, he was like, let's find these, these wooden ones. And um, I, I don't know what you're going to do with it, but there are just times where I, I look at something and say, I just need something to put my hands on to remind myself of what it what sacrifice and obedience and faith looks like. And so um, I thought I'd give you this. I wrote on mine, raised the knife and I just put the date and I'll just slip it in my Bible. And just a great reminder for me that, um, man, I want to have a faith that that truly recognize that God has life and death in his hands.